Hello, I'm Dr. Terry Susan Fine, Content Specialist for the Florida Joint Center for Citizenship, which is part of the School of Politics, Security, and International Affairs at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. Welcome to our Middle School Civics Highlight Series. Today we focus on benchmark CG 3.14, explain the purpose and function of the Electoral College in electing the President of the United States. We first begin with part one, explaining the origin of the Electoral College and the changes made to it by the 12th Amendment. Students will explain the origin of the Electoral College and the changes made to it by the 12th Amendment and focus on those same questions. Let's begin with Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution. Below you see an excerpt of Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution focusing on the Electoral College. Here it says that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature may direct a number of electors. So already we see state power. States have the power to decide how to select the members of the Electoral College representing that state. How many electors? The number of electors is equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. So we know that every state, regardless of size, is entitled to at least three members of Congress, two U.S. senators per state, regardless of size, and one representative per state, also regardless of size. This means that some of the small states that have fewer people living in them than a typically sized congressional district are entitled to one representative because congressional districts do not cross state lines. Therefore, the number of electors who represent each state is equal to the total number of members of Congress representing each state, although a person cannot be a member of Congress and serve in the Electoral College. Therefore, every state is guaranteed a minimum number of electors of three. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be president. So the Electoral College votes. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be president. In every case, after the choice of the president, the person having the greatest number of votes of the elector shall be vice president. So what this means is, is that under the original U.S. Constitution that was ratified in 1788, that it was the second place winner it was the second place winner who would become vice president. The person who got the most electoral votes, that person would become president. The person who came in second place, that person would become vice president. So the system was designed in some respects to be both representative of diverse viewpoints in that people who supported the person who became the president they, their viewpoints were represented by the president, but also the person who lost, right? The person who came in second and the person who lost, that person's viewpoint also became part of government by that person becoming vice president. The 12th Amendment changed this because the 12th Amendment requires the separate election of president and vice president. That means that the president and vice presidential candidates now can run together as a team. And the inherent competition, the competition that the original system created was addressed by the 12th Amendment. Here it says, the electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president. So two separate votes the person having the greatest number of votes for president shall be the president. So that means that when people, when the electors vote for president, they only vote for president. Whoever comes in second place for president doesn't 
get to become president or anything else for that matter. The person having the greatest number of votes as vice president shall be the vice president. Again, the person who gets the greatest number of votes for vice president becomes vice president. Persons who come in second place or other places, they don't become office holders at all. So we can see how the 12th Amendment created a two-part process rather than one process with two steps, right? The first step is who gets the most electoral votes as president, who gets the second highest as vice president. That brought some competition where people who competed against one another, one served as vice president to the one who won, and that could create some discomfort. Here with the 12th Amendment, by having separate votes and separate elections by the electors, that means that the president and vice presidential candidates can run as a team, such as from the same political party. Here we have a sample electoral vote ballot, the certificate of the vote from the state of Arizona. And so this is showing that uh, focusing on the 2012 presidential election, that there was here are all the electoral votes for president for Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney, because he did not get as many electoral votes as his competitor, who was Barack Obama, the incumbent president at the time. So Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden, they were reelected together as a team. And Mitt Romney and Congressman Paul Ryan, who was his running mate, did not get elected. But we see this is a very interesting demonstration as to what electro a certificate of the vote for the presidential electoral ballot actually what it looks like. And it includes a seal. It includes a seal of the state of Arizona. It includes signatures. It includes a signature of the Secretary of State. So it's really very interesting to look at. Thank you for joining me for Middle School Civics Highlights. Do you still have questions? If so, please contact us using the information that appears on the screen. Till next time, I'm Dr. Terry Susan Fine. Thank you for joining me.